Roberto, do you listen to me? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, good morning. Welcome to our last day of the webinar, uh, Zebrafish as Experimental Model for Research. I'm Roberto Martins. I'm assistant researcher at the University of Aveiro, and I'm really uh, pleased to uh, welcome, uh, welcome you on board of this uh, fantastic uh, webinar, Zebrafish. This uh, morning session will be composed by two uh, short presentations and uh, one lecture. And uh, the first presentation will be held by uh, Nia Rajput, that, uh, is a, a, that which is a graduate student uh, from uh, the Wayne State University uh, from Detroit, Michigan, at the United States. Uh, she uh, works uh, on the individual differences uh, in uh, behavior uh, using adult zebrafish. And I'm pleased to um, introduce you. And uh, Nia, uh, the floor is yours. So, uh, Nia, uh, as having some problems in the connection, so uh, please uh, uh, let's wait a bit uh, by our colleague. Uh, let's see if she can solve uh, the, the Wi Fi uh, connection. Just, uh, just a bit. She's not uh, yet here. She was some, uh, some minutes ago. So I, uh, I hope that uh, you are enjoying uh, the webinar. Um, so we will uh, put once again uh, our uh, presentation video uh, to, uh, to wait uh, that she can uh, connect or reconnect uh, the connection. So let's wait some minutes and uh, let's uh, see uh, again the presentation. My name is Mark Francis. I'm the founder of Aquaneering. For the last 20 years, Aquaneering has built a team of dedicated professionals to support your research. Our mission is simple. Provide the highest performance zebrafish housing at a reasonable cost. Our team is here to allow you to focus on your research. We at Alesco work daily to create solutions and equipment for the scientific community, contributing to the advancement of Latin America biomedical research. Our mission is greater than just providing equipment. It is to provide security with a quality service and mainly with enormous respect and attention. For this reason, we invest in high technology and seek to maintain long-lasting relationships. Our commitment is to be a reliable partner that understands the needs, the reality, and the conditions of each customer to always offer the best solution. We understand the benefits of scientific research for humanity, and this encourages us. If today we have a better quality of life, greater longevity. If we beat cancer or use a medicine for a headache, it is because the advance of biomedical research allows us to. We trust in the work of researchers, in science, and the scientific community and we pride ourselves on doing our part. Just like you, we are passionate. Science is what moves us. Because for Alesco, research is for life. Welcome everyone to FST's presentation. We appreciate you taking the time today and look forward to helping you find the right tools for the right application and your endless discoveries and research. Find Science Tools has been in business for over 45 years, providing scientists, researchers, and other life science professionals with high quality surgical instruments utilizing German steel and German craftsmanship with a secondary quality control inspection in our Heidelberg office. As we say, we only carry the best and offer a multitude of fine microsurgical instruments like spring scissors, forceps and rangers, but also a variety of options for wound closures and animal identification. In addition to our three FST offices, we have over 50 distributors worldwide. While the majority of the audience is based in the USA, Please note that we can ship anywhere in the world and any products not listed in our physical catalog or online at findscience.com can be sourced as a special order and we will work with you to get you what you need. Before we start, for those who are unfamiliar with FST, 
Let me go over our core values we hold ourselves to and strive to provide to our customers. Quality. Impeccable product quality is what differentiates FST from the others. Secondly, our customer support. We strive for 100% customer satisfaction. Lastly, our QC department in Germany upholds our manufacturers to the standards FST and our customers expect with every instrument. Hi everyone, good morning once again. Uh, we uh, welcome you again uh, to our last day of the webinar Zebrafish as experimental model for research. Um, we, we restarted the connection uh, with uh, Nir uh, Rajput, uh, which will be our first presenter of the uh, session uh, of our morning. Um, Nia uh, Rajput is undergraduate student at uh, the Wayne State University at Detroit, Michigan, uh, at the United States. And she uh, is uh, working on the identification of the individual differences uh, in the behavior using adult zebrafish. And uh, I'm really pleased to, um, uh, to invite Nia uh, for our floor uh, to present uh, zebrafish as a model for studying individual behavior differences uh, in exploration. Nia, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, thank Hi. you. Um... I'll share my screen and let me know if you can see that because I think there's some issues with the connection. Uh, we are not seeing yet uh, yeah, the yeah, presentation. Yeah. Let's see if it works uh, perfectly. Okay, can you see it now? Is opening the presentation, so let's wait. So now uh, we are seeing your presentation and you can go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to talk about my research work uh, in between the whole zebrafish community people. I'm really glad. And um, today I'll be talking about my research work, and that is identifying individual behavioral differences using zebrafish as a study model. So I'll begin my presentation by asking a very basic yet important question, and that is why do individuals behave differently? Or why, or why do humans vary in their propensity to take risk? Now, the examples of behavioral variations are very common, but how they arise is poorly understood. Now, the factors like the biology and the environment are known to influence this behavior the environment and biology interact to drive the behavior. And the changes or the variations in the biological factors like the strain and sex influence or changes the behavior. Differences in behavior is really important for the survival and evolutionary fitness. And um, it's um, individual behavioral differences are known to be present in many species or, or in wide range of Texas. For example, in humans, these individual differences are thought to be um, unknown to be studied by using this different personality traits. For example, neurotism, extrovertness, and openness. 
These personality traits are often heritable and are consistent over time. But how or what is the biological basis of these different personality traits are is still unclear or remains hidden. Similar to the humans, in animals as well, like in lizards, bears, birds, and in the fish, these individual differences are observed. And most widely studied uh, axis uh, that captures these behavioral differences uh, is the bold and shy axis. Now, in bold and shy axis, the bold animals are the ones that tends to explore or investigate the new environment uh, more re readily as compared to the shy animals. The shy animals, they are not open to the new environment or they are um, a little hesitant to explore the new environment. To measure um, these um, bold and shy axes, different behavioral paradigms are used. Most commonly used ones are novel tank test and open field test. Now, these two tests are used for measuring the response of the fish in a novel environment. Novel tank test is used as both novel tank test and open field test are used as a predator avoidance behavior measurement. Now, in novel tank test, the parameter like the bottom dwelling is measured. And then the idea is that when the animal is exposed to a new environment, it tends to stay at the bottom of the tank. That is, it will spend most of the time towards the bottom of the tank. And then the reason behind is that animals uh, are swimming at the bottom or stay at the bottom to avoid any predatory birds attacking them from the top. So if the animal that is spending most of the time towards the bottom of the tank or is uh, doing the bottom dwelling is considered as a shy animal, whereas the animals that is spending most of the time at the top of the tank is considered as a bold animal. Similarly, for the open field test, uh, the animal's response towards the open field test is the thigmotaxis. Thigmotaxis is tendency of an animal to stay towards the periphery of the tank. And the idea behind this is that if the animal stays more towards the center of the tank, there are more chances of the predator attack on the animals. So if the, uh, if the fish is spending most of the time towards the periphery of the tank, that means it's a shy fish. And if the fish that is spending most of the time towards the center of the tank, that is considered as a bold fish. Um, However, um, this bold and shy axis, um, we believe that this bimodal distribution of the behavior into bold and shy axis does not adequately captures the complete breadth of behavioral variation in zebrafish. And we hypothesize that like humans, zebrafish behavior is complex and they display multiple behavior types. However, these behavior types remain elusive or are hidden because most of the study uses the small sample size um, and they are assessing only one or two specific behavior types. Therefore, to investigate these multiple behavioral types and to overcome these limitations, we are using uh, or we captured the three-dimensional behavior of the fish. Since the behavior of the zebrafish is known to be influenced by the biological factors, we are using four different strains of animals, and these are PUs, TS, ABs, and VEX, and both the sex of the animal. So to capture the behavior of the fish, we are using this. Um, just quickly, can they hide it? So to capture the behavior of the fish, we are using this um, five-side frosted tank, and we're recording the be behavior with this Intel RealSense camera. We record the behavior of the fish for six minutes in the snow world tank test. And it is recorded by this Intel RealSense camera that has both the color stream as well as the depth stream. Now, color stream give us the XY coordinate of the fish whereas this depth coordinate gives the z position of the um, fish or the depth of the fish in the tank. Using this color video of the fish, um, we track the uh, behavior or we track the fish using the deep learning algorithm that is the deep lab cut. Deep lab cut uses the five different body parts uh, to the length of the fish and then tracks, tracks it. 
this tracked video is super superimposed into this uh, depth uh, depth stream to generate these 3D traces of the animal. So the 3D traces are generated by using a deep lab cut. Once we have these 3D um, traces, we are extracting the four behavioral parameters. Now, these uh, out of these four behavioral parameters, two are the positional parameters and two are related to the activity of the fish. In the positional parameters, we are determining the position of uh, the animals. The first one is the bottom distance. That is the distance of the fish from the bottom. And then the other one is the center distance. That is the distance of the fish from the center. These two um, uh, behavioral parameters captures the um, bottom dwelling and thigmotaxis respectively. For the activity um, uh, parameters, we are using the distance traveled by the fish in the tank and then the percentage of the tank explored by the fish. Using these um, four behavioral parameters, um, what we asked first was whether there is any non-normal distribution in the values of these excretory parameters. And what we found was that for the, um, for example, over here, for the AB fish, if we look at, for the uh, behavioral parameters, that is the percentage explored by the fish in the tank, what we found was that there is a bimodal distribution. So uh, within the same uh, strain and the same sex, there is a variation in the behavior uh, for the percentage of the tank explored by the fish. Now, if we look at the TL strain right here for the percentage explored or the TL fish for the distance of the bottom parameters, we can see there is a significant non-normal distribution in the TL female strain. And again, it's same strain, same sex, but there is a behavioral variation there. So it says, or uh, this explains that there is a non-normal distribution in these behavioral parameters. So next we are asking is, are these behavioral parameters correlated to each other? Or are these behavioral parameters are individually capturing different aspects of, expl of exploration? So we look for the, um, this correlation by using this Spearman's correlation. And what we found was that for the uh, correlation between the distance traveled and then the percentage explored by the fish, there's a positive correlation and as expected. Uh, so the more the animal is traveling, there's more uh, the uh, chances of the exploration or more it is exploring the tank. So there's a positive correlation between these two parameters for all these strains. Okay, and next we look for the correlation between the bottom distance and then the uh, percentage of the um, tank explored by the fish. And we saw that there is some correlation over here for the different strains as well. And it's, it's clear that if the animal is um, distance for the animal from the bottom is more, there is more um, likelihood of the animal to for the exploration of the tank. So the correlation between the distance, uh, bottom distance, and the person to explore is there is present. However, the most interesting and surprising thing what we found over here was a correlation between the um, bottom distance and center distance. So there was not a very correlation. Uh, a very clear correlation between the dis bottom distance and then the center distance. However, we were thinking that uh, this whole center distance, that is the thigmotaxis, it captures the same predator avoidance behavior. So there has to be a, like a small, some correlation between uh, this bottom distance and the center distance. However, we didn't see that over here. So it says that the this thigmotaxis that is in with correspondence to the rodents one that we see that they explore the more uh, periphery is not clear in the case of zebrafish. So in the zebrafish, we cannot or we should not uh, consider this uh, thigmotaxis as a predator avoidance behavior. That's what our data suggests at least. So these uh, behavioral parameters are um, to some extent independent of each other or are not correlated to each other. So, uh, so this brings to the um, uh, this brings us to the question that are there these multiple behavioral types then? So since there is a non a non normal distribution of, of our data, and then each individual behavioral parameters are independent of each other, therefore we are using this unsupervised machine learning algorithm to detect whether there are a different behavioral types. 
So to uh, use this unsupervised machine learning algorithm, we are using or we generated a k-nearest neighbor network and then applied a low-end clustering on it. And what we found was that zebrafish behavior stratifies into four distinct clusters. So each color that we are looking at is four clusters. That is the four multiple behavioral clusters we have captured. And then the data points within these clusters is an individual fish. The um, bold colors within the uh, shapes are the different strains, presenting different strains. And then the shapes of these uh, data points is the different uh, sex we have used for this study. So we see there is uh, these four distinct clusters we have captured. Now the behavior associated with this cluster can be seen over here on these bar plots. And what we found was that uh, along with the most or highly studied um, or highly stu re reported uh, bold and shy behavior, we found that there are two new behavioral types and we call them as wall huggers and active explorer. Now, if we look at this clusters in association with this bar graph, and we talk about this cluster number one, that is the shy cluster. So this cluster, that is the animals falling into this cluster, is showing the shy behavior. And then the uh, behavioral parameters associated with the, this cluster can be seen right these, with the, these bar plots. So if we talk about the shy cluster right here, distance, bottom distance for the shy cluster is really low. That means the animals that falls into this cluster are spending most of the time towards or are more towards the bottom of the tank. Along with this uh, bottom distance, the other parameters like the center, uh, center distance, distance traveled, and then the percentage explored are low. So they are more towards the uh, bottom and spending less time in um, exploration or in uh, traveling more or in exploring the more areas of the tank. And if we talk about the cluster number four right here, that means these set of fish that falls into cluster four are showing the bold behavior. That means uh, the bottom distance for them is more, they are spending more time towards the bottom or towards the top of the tank. And then the percentage explored by the animal is more. So they are uh, more towards the top and spending uh, or exploring more uh, percentage area of the tank. And hence they are considered as, or at, we label them as a bold fish. But over here, if we talk about the wall huggers and active explorer, there are the parameters for the wall hugger that is the center distance is more for the wall huggers. That means they are towards the periphery of the tank. And hence, they are spending more time towards the periphery. So we call them as wall huggers. For the active explorers, though, um, the uh, amount of um, percentage explored by these animals and then the distance traveled by this animal is um, high. Hence, they are considered as an active explorer because they spend time exploring the tank and traveling more. So it's clear that um, they are not only just the bold and shy behavior displayed by the zebrafish, but there are multiple behavioral types as we shown here uh, that are displayed by the fish. So next we are asking is whether these behavioral clusters are influenced by the strain and sex. So over here in this graph, we can see that there are indeed um, the influence of sex and strain on these behavioral cluster. So if we talk about this strain, TL strain, and uh, TL strain, regardless of both sex, male or female, these are in cluster number one. So they are the shy animals. So you can see right here, both the male and female are overrepresented in the shy cluster or cluster number one. And if we talk about the AB strain, uh, in AB strain, the females specifically are overrepresented in cluster number two. That means AB females are more of the wall huggers. And the, for the TU strain, like here, you can see that the TU strain males are overrepresented in cluster number three. That means the TU males are the active explorer. Okay, so um, over here, this graph uh, represents that there is, or this graph display that there is indeed uh, influence of these strain and sex on these behavioral clusters. And hence, the behavior that is displayed by the fish is influenced by the strain and sex. Okay, 
So um, after looking at the behavioral sectors, we are looking for the consistencies of this behavior over the time of two days. Now, so for calculating this behavioral consistency, we are using um, the animals that were exposed to, to the NOVA tank test on day one, and then the same animals were exposed on the day two in the same NOVA tank test. And so to represent this uh, change in the behavior or um, same behavioral type, we are using this uh, core diagram. So this core diagram represents the transition of the behavioral cluster between day one and day two. So if you talk about cluster number two right here, that means those are the wall hugger animals. On day one, these set of fish um, remains into the same cluster on day two as well. So these set of the fish uh, displayed the wall hugging behavior on day one. And when we expose them on day two in the NOVA 10 test, these set of the fish out of these ones remains in the same cluster. That means they displayed the same wall hugging behavior. And if we talk about cluster number three, there are these fish that, uh, that were present in cluster number three on day one. And we ex when we expose them to the um, day two in the NOVA 10 test, this set of the fish remains into the same cluster on day two as well. That means they were showing this active exploration on day two as well. However, there were few of set of the fish that changed the um, cluster uh, on day two. So if we look at this set of the fish that were on that were in cluster number three on day one, they transitioned to cluster number four on day two. That means from um, active uh, explorer cluster, they moved to the bold um, cluster over here. And so what we found was that overall, uh, out of our 400 uh, fish, 40, 54% of our fish shares the same behavioral cluster. That means 54% of the fish were showing the same behavior type they were showing between day one and day two. Okay, uh, over here, we are showing that um, the overlap of these um, cluster percentage of the cluster shared between day one and day two. So the, the, this, these are the four clusters right here and between day one and day two. So if we look at this cluster number one right here, only 39% um, of the fish remains into the same cluster between day one and day two. So there were like 39% of the fish that were um, in the shy cluster on day one, they remain into the shy cluster on day two as well. However, if we look at this one, uh, on on a clutch for the cluster number two, we can see between day one and day two, there is more number of or the percentage increase to the 73% now. And for the other ones, the um, change in the cluster is average. That is the 50%, around 50%. So um, the uh, over here, it's interesting to see that most of the animals are um, preferring to uh, spend or changing the clusters and remaining in the cluster number two. That means they're uh, showing this um, wall hugging behavior between day one and day two. Also, if we look at these percentage right here, the transition of these percentage changes uh, from cluster number one to cluster number uh, two, cluster number three, and cluster number four, there's not huge change between these uh, transition between cluster number one, two, and three. So the shy animals are not um, coming, uh, so the animals are not changing their uh, behavior from the wall huggers or active explorer or bold to the shy one. So, um, and it kind of makes sense because when you're exposing the animals uh, for day one and day two to get assigned um, consecutively, then there is a chance of habituation happening there. So there's a chance of learning and the animals um, become more uh, open to the environment. So they are not showing the shy behavior, but they're showing or changing to the either the bold behavior or the active explorer or the ball huggers. So there's a consistency in the behavior between day one and day two. Okay. So um, after looking at the uh, consistency for two days consecutively, what we did next is look for the consistency of this behavioral type uh, over the multiple days and multiple weeks. So we exposed the animals uh, over the multiple days, like on day one and then consecutively up till day five. And uh, for the uh, weekly experiments, we exposed the animal, same animal to the um, uh, uh, week zero, and then uh, every other week we are exposing exposing the animals to the NOVA tank test. And um, so for this one, we are using the TN TU strain of, for checking the consistency over the multiple days as well as the multiple weeks. And what we found was that 
So this right here, this graph shows uh, the cluster of the animals between day one, day two, day three, and day five. And over here, you can see right here, this set of the fish, they remains into the same cluster in all five days. So if they are um, shy on day one, they'll be, they are shy on day two, three, four, and five. And this set of animals, if they are, um, they are showing the wall hugging behavior on day one, they are showing it all on five days. So at least there are more than 50% of the animals um, were showing the same behavior on all five days, or at least um, four, uh, four days out of the whole five-day experiments, they are showing this consistency in the behavior. However, there are a few set of animals right here that are um, showing or changing their behavior uh, for every, every other day. So they are being consistently inconsistent. So if they are showing, for example, right here, this animal is showing the shy behavior on uh, day one, then it's transitioning it, uh, its um, cluster or changing its behavior uh, to this cluster number four, that is the bold behavior, and then to the active explorer, and then to the wall hugger. So it's continuously changing its behavior. Okay. And um, over here, we are showing that there is a tra the transition in the clustering. So we can see that this right here, there's a change in the cluster from um, shy, and it's changing uh, to the wall huggers, and it remains consistent to the wall huggers on wall huggers and wall huggers. So there's a change in the transition between the animals that are from the shy, and it's changing the cluster to the, um, to the wall huggers or the active explorers. And then we calculated the percentage of these uh, clustering overlap between the uh, five days. And what we found was that on each day, there was an increase in the percentage of these uh, clustering overlap. And it, um, it shows that there is this habituation process happening over here when the animal is exposed multiple times over five days. So they are learning uh, about the environment they are exposed. And then with the change in the, or with the multiple exposure in the tank, uh, they are becoming more open and then they are changing or transitioning and uh, the percentage overlap for the uh, clustering increases between day one and all the way to the day five. Okay, so um, the animal is or at least over here, the TU strain is showing the consistency over multiple days. So um, right here, you can see there are a set of animals that are con consistent throughout the five day experiment. Next, we looked for the uh, behavioral consistency over multiple day, over multiple weeks, that is for the long term um, duration of the exposure. And again, what we found was that there are a set of the fish that were um, continuous or that were consistent in their behavior throughout this whole 10 week experiment. So um, this over here, these set of the fish, they are showing the same behavioral type throughout this whole 10 week experiment. And also along with these uh, fish that are showing all uh, this same behavior in the 10 weeks, there are some set of the fish that are at least showing the behavior in um, uh, this at least in the um, eight weeks out of the 10 weeks, the same kind of behavior. And in this um, uh, this experiment as well, there are a set of fish that are changing their um, cluster over the multiple exposure as you expose. Similar, um, uh, similar to the week, um, uh, daily data, there is a transition between the clustering in the weekly data as well, as we can see. Uh, so over here, you can see for the shy fish and for the wall huggers, there is a transition. This set of the fish is um, remains in the same shy cluster, whereas uh, there are fish that are transitioning to this um, that remains in the same uh, wall huggers. And then there are fish that goes into the bold um, behavior on uh, that, that are displaying the bold behavior on week two. And if we look at this um, cluster number two that were all the animals that were in cluster number three, that is the active explorer. They have this continuous showing this active exploration throughout this whole week. So they are not changing or they are not transitioning to any other cluster between uh, week zero all the way to week 10. And then next, uh, we looked for the percentage overlap uh, through, between these um, multi-weeks uh, experiment. And what we found that, similar to the daily data, uh, there is increase in this uh, percentage overlap over these uh, 10 weeks data. So uh, even for the long-term um, uh, exposure or in the long-term repeatability of the behavior, these animal shows consistency. There is a consistency, and the animal is uh, showing this habituation and showing the similar kind of behavior over the multiple weeks as well. 
Okay. So um, I'll conclude uh, my presentation or talk by um, discussing some bullet points. Uh, so um, we found that in our study, animals are is showing uh, the behavior that is beyond the bold and shy, and they are showing this multiple behavioral types, and those are uh, the uh, wall huggers, and those are bold fish, active explorers, and the shy animals. Um, and we have seen, or um, I have shown you in the data, that uh, there is influence of sex and strain on these uh, behavioral clusters, or these behavioral types are influenced by these biological factors. And um, uh, with the biweekly data and then the daily data and the two days data, it is clear that uh, the animal has this um, um, stability over time. So the behavior is stable over time and they show the same behavioral type uh, if they are exposed for a short term of time or for the long term of, of time. Okay, and then um, with, the, with this, I'll go to my future direction that I'm working on. So, um, Using these behavioral cluster, I'm trying to predict or I'm working on uh, using these behavioral uh, cluster to predict the other behavior, other behavior as well. So the idea is that the animal that is showing the um, bold behavior in the novel tank test can we predict the uh, behavior of that animal in some other behavior paradigm, for example, in the aggressive behavior, will that animal will display an aggression or not? So that is the um, current work, uh, the thing I'll be working on. And other than that, I'm also looking for identifying the individual behavioral differences uh, using the neural basis or trying to identify the neural basis of these individual differences. And for that, I'll be using uh, the this um, brain atlas that is uh, developed by our lab. And this is the adult zebrafish brain atlas known as the ESBA and using this adult zebra zebrafish atlas for the registration of my brain images, I'll be um, uh, identifying the regions or um, the regions responsible for causing these individual differences. And uh, with that, I'll thank um, webinar zebrafish organizer, my lab member, and most importantly, my advisor, Dr. Kenny. And um, I'm really thankful for the funding given by the NIH. And um, thank you for your attention. And I'd love to take any questions if you have. Thank you very much, Nia. It was a great presentation. I'm really impressed. Thank you very Thank much you. Uh, for your work. And I I will move now on for the questions. Uh, we have some, so far we have uh, one question. Uh, please, uh, if you have any question, um, uh, you have now the opportunity uh, to write it on the, the chat. Uh, please kindly ask uh, Nia. I guess Nia will be really pleased to uh, reply to your questions. We have now a question from uh, Dr. Uh, Yves uh, Charlie da Silva, uh, which uh, say you, um, well, very interesting research, obviously. Uh, and uh, he's asking you, um, do you know how accurate this method is? Uh, does it use neural math networks? Uh, did you already compare uh, your results with other softwares? Uh, sorry, I did, didn't didn't get the question. I, so, is it okay uh, if I we have, now, uh, we have three questions here. Uh, the okay. first one is, uh, do you know how accurate uh, is this method? Um, uh, which method? Uh, I assume that the method that you, well, that you presented um, accurate, like for uh, generating our uh, clustering. Uh, I I don't know, um, uh, but you can uh, you can try to uh, to explore uh, or, or to explain better that part of the clustering. Okay, so um, right here, how we like like why how we generated this uh, cluster right here. So um, we created a network that is using the um, K nearest neighbor and we applied the Lewin clustering on it. So if you, because in the K clustering uh, K nearest neighbor, there is a factor of uh, determining the K value. So um, for that, we have determined the K value and then we have um, 
use the other parameters to uh, check the values of the k, whether it, it's, it uh, changes with the change in the cluster that we are getting. So we have double checked uh, those by using the different uh, methods. And I can show you that. I think I have that on my supplementary information. Um, so uh, we are generating this um, behavioral cluster uh, using this KNN with Lowane, and then we are double checking or determining the values of K by using these different um, indices, and that is the kelehansky herbaz index, and then we are checking that with using the uh, three different index, that is first is Kelehansky, and then the silhouette, and then the, the davis Balding. And over here, this is how we are determining the K value. And you can see right here with this values of K, right, between this to this range, the values of the or the number of cluster doesn't change. So it remains the same. So we are getting the four cluster for all three indices that we have. And then we are taking the average of this, and then we got the number uh, that is 118 to calculate uh, or to determine these uh, or to generate this uh, nearest neighbor graph. So yeah, we kind of check that as well. I, I don't know if that's the uh, like the answer you were expecting because I couldn't get the question. But usually the question that is asked from me is if we have like determined this values of k properly or not. So yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, let's assume that uh, uh, that was uh, the the question of Dr. Eves. Okay. But uh, he also asked you uh, if uh, uh, the uh, the method uh, uses neural networks. Neural networks. Which method? Well, uh, your research. <laughs> your research. Oh, uh, oh, for my research, neural networks. Yes. Oh, I mean, uh, so if if we talk about the um, the deep lab cut, that's kind of um, a supervised learning algorithm, and it's I think it's generated using the neural nets that we use, like use for that we use for training the data set that we have. Uh, for identifying the different body parts. So yes, we have used that deep learning algorithm, deep lab cut as a part of like a neural net. So yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and did you compare uh, the um, your uh, data set uh, with other software? Other software, like what? I mean, other software. Um, I, I assume so. You you have used this uh, very nice software, uh, uh, which looks like really reliable. Uh, but um, uh, the question is: is in fact if you already compared also your uh, your data uh, with the data from other uh, softwares? Um, so I'm not sure about like other software. What it should be like? What what kind of question? What question is it? But I think if you're, if the question is whether we have, if if our uh, the type of behaviors that we are getting is um, similar to the other studies, I will say that out of four, the two behaviors are similar to the other studies. That is the bold and the shy behavior. But the rest two are the new ones that has like hardly reported. Um, but I'll say that uh, the behavior of the thigmotaxel that we kind of contradict over here or over here, we have like a different finding than the other. Um, studies and i'll say the people have reported that the thigma taxes and the, the um is not related to the predator avoidance so i i think there are studies out there kind of validates what we are doing in in our lab though i'm still not sure if i'm ask if the if i'm answering the correct question or if the i, I i'm not sure and that's i guess it, I, I guess that we are happy with your reply <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, before finishing, because I'm trying to check uh, if we have some some extra comments uh, or questions. Uh, so just to congratulate you on the chat, uh, I will ask you just a very uh, very big, uh, very final question. Um, your uh, your research is uh, really uh, really nice, um, uh, as I said some minutes ago. Uh, which are the implications uh, that you foresee from your study uh, from now on? Because uh, it looks like that uh, it will be really uh, that is really novel your work. Uh, which are the implications uh, in terms of uh, research uh, using the Zebrafishes model? Um, I mean. Um... I think with this one, um, like if, if we're able to identify the brain regions that are causing these individual individual differences using uh, the neural basis, so I think um, uh, if it 
talk in terms of like where we can imply these um, so we can identify that okay these regions are causing these individual differences and we can establish that okay there are these biological factors causing these differences and um, that can these uh, factors can be taken into consideration when you are generating uh, personalized medicines for uh, for any kind of uh, disorders so we can take these things or these um, results into you know consideration while doing that as, as, so yeah. uh, I'm really uh, uh, so I, I'm really happy with your reply. Uh, thank you very much, Nia. Um, okay. So okay. since we have no more uh, questions, I don't know if you wish to uh, to say something or to comment uh, something else from your side. Yeah, it's just like I'm really happy to um, present my work over here in front of all the zebrafish people. It's it, it was my first uh, talk. I am kind of have an experience giving the poster talk, but this was like the first talk that I have given. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy and I was excited. I'm excited. Yeah. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I should congratulate you because if it's the first time uh, you uh, you did really well, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I hope that you have a, a very pleasant future in your research. And now we will move for the next presentation. Thank you, Nia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, so um, I'm pleased to to now uh, to present uh, the next presentation uh, by uh, Paula uh, Marroquin and uh, Daniela Suarez, um, which are undergraduate students from the Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. Um, uh, these uh, Paula and Daniela are uh, undergraduate students uh, from biotechnology uh, engineering, and um, uh, they they will present us uh, the uh, presentation uh, entitled "Evaluation of the Colors Blue, Green, and Green as an Alternative to the Standard Red Color." Evaluation of the Optomotor Response. <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, evaluation of the colors blue, green, and red. I saw uh, a mistake in the title. So, uh, evaluation of the colors blue, green, and red as an alternative to the standard black color using the evaluation of the optomotor response. Uh, Paula and uh, Daniela, uh, the floor is uh, are yours. Thanks. Hi, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting us to this amazing Zebrafish as an experimental model for research webinar. We're excited to present our work on the evaluation of the colors blue, green, and red as an alternative to the standard black color that is commonly used in the evaluation of the optomotor response, also known as OMR. But first, let us introduce ourselves. We are Paula Marroquin and Daniela Suarez, undergrad students for, from Tecno Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. We are currently studying biotechnology engineering and our university recently opened a multidisciplinary zebrafish laboratory where we had the opportunity to work with this with this model we have been able to present this work nationally nationally at the expo bioengineers at our university where we were awarded best poster and internationally at the international zebrafish conference where we were supported with the international zebrafish conference award so our lab was started in October 2021, and as a young lab, we needed tools to evaluate the response of zebrafish and zebrafish larvae. So we took a standard test, which, which is the optimal response, and proposed some changes in order to try to make it better and easier to perform. And before we start with our talk, we want to politely ask you your discretion with our results, since this is our project for obtaining our bachelor's degree. Now. The optimotor response is a visually mediated behavioral test in which zebrafish larvae start swimming prompted by visual motion clues given. These clues have been usually high contrast images such as alternating black and white lines in motion. Zebrafish eyes contain almost all the basic structures of the human eye. Since both are arranged in layers, they differ in small things such as the lens shape. So this makes it an excellent model for ocular drug discovery and disease modeling. And they are also tetrachromatic animals with red, blue, green, and UV cones. And since they are tetrachromatic animals, we wanted to see if there was a color preference. It is reported that animals can exhibit preference for colors that match their environment. 
These preferences may impact their ability to learn associations with colors. And there's an innate color preference or rejection that helps in the recognition of the environment and can give information on how to appropriately respond to an environmental stimuli. So here you can see an example of the standard, te of the standard OMR test uh, that we performed. It starts with five seconds on widescreen, then the visual clues goes on and they last for one minute where th the first 30 seconds are for adaptation and the next 30 seconds are the time that we give the libraries to perform the test. At the end, we also added five seconds on widescreen. These seconds are for us to target the larvae in case we want to do a video tracking. And as you can see, the larvae are starting to go up here and that's the response to the OMR test. Our goal was to find an alternative to the black color that is commonly used in the field. Since both the larvae and the lines are black, they get lost, making it difficult to track them and get a reliable resource. So as we mentioned before, zebrafish are tetrachromat animals. So we tested the response to the OMR in different conditions of colors. We implemented this test by using a software that our team helped us to make. It's very easy to use. The space bar on the keyboard puts a white screen or it starts the life running. The arrow keys can change the width and speed of the lines. And with the keys B, A, R, and G, we can change the colors. And additionally, we wanted to see if there was an influence on the response of the larvae if we change the width and speed of the lines. So we tested three different conditions of width and speed. And when performing the OMR test, we put 30 libraries on each petri, petri dish and established the system, as you can see in the, on the screen, uh, where the computer screen with the visual images was on the bottom. On top of the computer screen was the petri dish, and 30 centimeters above was a microscope that we used to film. And uh, you can see the specifications of the measurement in the image. And in order to make this test, we we had the help of the engineer Magelia Bundes during her stay in the laboratory. Here you can see that the colors that we used were black, red, blue, and green. The videos will start. And we use absolute colors for each of the lines. Uh, we counted the mobile larvae that were the ones that didn't perform well the test, and we tested their response the first 30 seconds and the last 30 seconds. And you can really see in the videos the contrast between the larvae in the red and the larvae in the black. So after performing the OMR test in triplicate, we collected the following data. Uh, so as can be seen in chart A, from day five post-fertilization, larvae began to respond to the OMR test. And as they blew by, uh, there is a better response of the larvae uh, for this test. This means that red and black colors did show the best immediate response, with a larger group of larvae responding in the first 30 seconds of the stimuli compared with blue and green colors. Whereas in chart B, the four color tested showed no significant difference in the adaptive response since all larvae had already reached their goal by the time of the test, by the time the test was scored. However, other conditions that can also change their behavior are variables such as speed and weight of the lines, uh, influencing the response of the larvae. So in charts C and D, you can see that the most significant difference was present with green compared to other colors. And uh, in both cases, you can see that green is having a lower response. And as demonstrated in chart E, red and black colors did not show a significant difference. Okay, now, so with the information gathered from our experiments, we can implement the OMR test with the best conditions for color, speed, and width of the lines, and use them for modeling ocular diseases or for testing different compounds that affect the larvae. And red and black colors did not, did not show a, a significant difference, showing that the red could represent the best larvae image. Uh, image contrast for a better quantification without the need of additional image processing or adjustment. Uh, additional, the variables such as the speed and weight of the visual clues can influence the response of the larvae. 
uh, the most significant difference was present with green uh, compared to the other colors, which suggests that green evokes a poorer response. Also, red and black colors showed the best immediate response with a larger group of larvae responding to the first 30 seconds of the stimuli compared with blue and green colors. And whereas the four colors tested show no significant difference in the adaptive response. But we want you to see that the OMR test is more than just a visual test. So let's start with the learning. Uh, we initially started this test because we realized that our larvae didn't need the 30 minutes of adapt adaptation reported in the literature to perform well in the OMR test. And there have been behavioral assays of learning and memory that are employed at the larval stage of zebrafish. This includes T maze, plus maze, Y maze, light and dark chamber, among others. And the majority of these assays are based on color discrimination. And it usually involves a visual stimuli. Stimuli. So we are proposing the OMR test not only as a behavioral test, but also as a learning test. And in order to see if the larvae had a learning pro process, we implemented the OMR test with the same conditions as in the first experiment. But this time it was a discontinuous test, meaning that it was a different batch of larvae each day. So the larvae of day six had never performed the test and so on. But everything we kept the same which was 30 larvae per Petri dish, absolute colors for the lines and blackout conditions. We also counted the number of immobile larvae that are the ones that they didn't perform the, the test. So in chart F and G, we show the number of immobile six day post fertilization larvae in all the widths and the four colors at 2.4 centimeters per second and 4.8 centimeters per second. But the green bars are the results of the continuous experiment where we use the same library for the, for the whole test, and the red bars are the results of the discontinuous experiment, where we use different libraries through every day of the experiment. Now, in both charts and in almost all the conditions, it can be clearly seen that there are more immobile library in the discontinuous experiment. And also here in chart H, where we now have a speed of 7.6 centimeters per second, it also shows more immobile library in the discontinuous experiment, which are the red bars compared to the continuous experiment, which are the green bars. In almost all the conditions evaluated and, and in most of the, yes. <laughs> uh, so in conclusion, the OMR test can go beyond a behavioral test. It could also represent an additional, an additional test for evaluating the zebra fish larvae, the zebra fish larvae learning. Uh, once again, the color red evokes a similar response to the standard color black, confirming that this color could also be an alternative to the standard color that is commonly used. We also showed that the, that the width of the lines can affect the response of the larvae in the discontinuous test, so that, factors need, need, that factor needs to be taken in consideration when performing this test. Now, we already know that Several fish, are lar several fish larvae are essential for toxicology studies. And now we, we know that the OMR can also be used as a behavioral test and a learning test. But we still wanted to go beyond that. We want to show that it can also be a tool for pharma pharmacological tests, where the response of the larvae can be affected by the presence of drugs. Um, and studies in zebra fish have provided critical information about the health effects of majority of all the 250 plus substances on the priori priority list of hazardous substances. Zebra fish can be used for high throughput chemical toxicity testing, allowing for a quick large scale screening similar to in, in vitro assays. So we now decided to test the standard, a standard depressor depressors such as alcohol to implement the OMR test as a tool for this pharmacological experiment. The ethanol exposure was made under the same conditions of the other two applications of the OMR, meaning we had all the conditions for width and speed, absolute black and red colors used, and 30 larvae per petri dish, and we counted the total of immobile larvae, meaning the ones that didn't perform the, the test correctly. 
For this experiment, we realized uh, we made the standard OMR test with one color, either black or red, and all the conditions for width and speed with terry larvae per petri dish at six days post fertilization. And we let them rest for 30 minutes in the incubator, and later we exposed the larvae to ethanol solution at 1.5% for two hours. Then we performed the OMR test again with the same color as before and all the conditions for width and speed. And now here you can see the video of the OMR test in color red before the exposure to ethanol. You can see that the larvae are following the lines and they're together over here. And on the other side, you can see that you can see the video of post exposure that is right here. And you can notice the decrease in their performance because in compared with the other video, the, these larvae have circular and side to side movements like this one right here that is moving and and not the straight movements as we can see in this video. So it's not that they are not performing the test, they are not performing it correctly. And now in this chart, you can see the number of immobile larvae increases after being exposed to the ethanol solution. And this right here is our chart for the, the same test, but in color red. As you can see, they both have pretty much the same number, same number of immobile larvae. And the, the width of the, of the lines can affect before the ethanol, but not after. So in conclusion, we can also use the OMR to evaluate the larva response for pharma pharmacological tests. As in here, using an already known and common depressant, the OMR response under stimuli of ethanol changes. Also, once again, red and black colors show no significant difference in the larva response for the OMR test, demonstrating that also in toxicology, red could be an alternative for the standard black color. And the width of the lines can affect the response of the larvae before their exposure to a solution of 1.5% ethanol at six days post fertilization. Now, beyond a visual test, a learning and a pharmacological tool, the next application of the optim optimator response test that we want to propose is disease modeling, such as obesity, diabetic retinopathy, and cardiovascular diseases. But we will focus on obesity for now. Some important and shocking facts about this controversial topic are that Mexico runs fifth place in obesity worldwide. It is estimated that by 2030, one out of three kids will suffer from obesity. In Mexico, the annual increase in infants with obesity is 2.5%. And as can be seen in the graph from Global Obesity Observatory, ever since 2012 up to 2020, there has been an increase in the percentage of children living with overweight or obesity. That's why it is of great importance to address this problem. And cardiovascular diseases continue to be a leading cause of, of mortality. And in the United States, it is estimated that obesity causes an excess of 300,000 deaths annually, and potentially it can reduce the lifespan up to 20 years. The spread of, obes of obesity epidemic will likely inversely impact life expectancy trends. And now, as you can see in this chart, the, the risk for having a heart failure, coronary disease, or a stroke are higher with, for people with severe obesity. Now, for, in order to make our larvae obese, we had these metabolic conditions where the, our control was a commercial food, and then we gave them an three different obesogenic foods, uh, plus the commercial food. And our last control was larvae with no food. This during seven, eight, and nine, nine days post fertilization. And we had the help of Marianne Ferreira to make this possible. We stained the larvae with nail red to verify if there was obesity. These photos are from day seven post fertilization where the mislocalization and or the lipid accumulation is signaled and is sustained. Now, now that we have confirmed that we had obese larvae, we wanted to check if there was a change in the cardiac response of this larvae by a heartbeat measurement. Now, to actually be able to use the OMR test in disease modeling, we are proposing it as a tool for larvae to exercise. 
to evaluate the relation between exercise and cardiovascular diseases. The larvae performed the test, the same OMR test we have been talking about for three minutes, but every 30 seconds, we change the direction of the lines so they will follow them every time the direction was changed, forcing them to exercise. Gathering all the results, the graph show in blue the heartbeats per minute of the larvae resting. In red, the heartbeats per minute after the three minute test in the lines in red. And last but not least, in black, we can see the heartbeats per minute after the three minute test, but now with black lines. And as can be seen, there's a great increase in the heartbeats per minute of the larvae with obesity, also showing that red has even a higher increase compared to black color. So in conclusion, the OMR induced exercise response shows an increase in the number of heartbeats per minute. The OMR test can represent an additional tool for disease modeling, which can provide different information than molecular tests. And lastly, the, the red color presents a greater number of bits, which is interesting for research related to cardiovascular diseases. So during our presentation, we mentioned some important points that we would like for you to take home. First is that the color red could represent an alternative to the standard black color commonly used in the OMR test, avoiding the need of image improvement, which is very hard, by the way. We tried to do it, but we are not no experts, so we couldn't do it, but it's very hard. Uh, secondly, the OMR test can be just can be more than just a behavioral test. It can be used to, as a tool to evaluate learning in zebrafish larvae, uh, the response to xenobiotics. So it can be used as a tool in pharmacological tests. And it also can be to simulate exercise in zebrafish larvae. So thanks for your attention. We would like to especially thank Dr. Samantha Carrilla and Dr. Cecilia Sanpedri, our PIs, for giving us the chance to work with this incredible model and for always supporting us. We would also like to give a very special thank to Professor Alfonso Rios, who has always been cheering us, cheering us up and always helping us with the statistical analysis. And also, engineer Magelia Bundes and Marian Ferreira for helping us with the experiments. Also, Damian Suarez, who designed the OMR program, who is also an undergrad. And we are so thankful with all of our lab team especially our PIs, and because almost a year ago, we had no knowledge on this kind of topics and the lab was barely starting. And now we are already having and presenting results and slowly growing in all of uh, the aspects of our lives. And now, last but not least, we are so thankful with the zebrafish community that has always been so welcoming with us and has opened us many opportunities. So that we now want to pursue a master's in zebrafish and continue on this wonderful path. Here are our mails if you'd like to contact us, and we're happy to answer any questions if we still have time left. Uh, thank you very much, Paula and Daniela. Uh, it was really, really nice presentation. Um, I will move directly to the questions uh, since the time is flying. Um, and uh, Tan, uh, a PhD student from the University of Liège uh, in uh, Belgium, uh, ask you um, if you do if you know uh, if there is color blindness uh, in zebrafish. There are larvae that can have color blindness, uh, but they're usually modified because they are born with the with the cones to see the. The colors and there are more tests that where they use colors and preference of colors to actually see if there's a blindness okay uh, thank you very much um, I uh, I hope that you have a, a really nice future uh, in your uh, in your career uh, and uh, I wish you uh, good luck for your research thank you very much Paula and Daniela uh, we we will now move uh, for the presentation, thank you, uh, of Dr. Valerie uh, Tornini, um, uh, which will uh, bring us the, the presentation entitled uh, Big Roles uh, for Tiny Peptides uh, in Vertebrate uh, Development. 
and uh, I will um, I want to introduce you uh, Dr. Uh, Valerie uh, which is currently a researcher at the Yale School of Medicine uh, with, and uh, she is supported by a K99 uh, uh, pathway uh, to independence award uh, from the United States National Institute of Health uh, Dr. Tonini um, started uh, using zebrafish as an experimental model uh, during our doctoral training uh, uh, with Dr. Ken Pauls. And uh, she uh, is used, um, uh, or she used the dual zebrafish fin regeneration uh, to understand how cells uh, in a complex adult tissue coordinately uh, regenerate a patterned uh, structure after injury. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Uh, Turini is working with uh, Dr. Antonio uh, Giraldes' uh, lab, and they are exploring the molecular players uh, that establish uh, and maintain diverse cell types, uh, especially uh, in the brain. Dr. Turini's uh, current research uses genetics and genomics, uh, genome engineering, behavioral and pharmacological assays, and zebrafishes animal models uh, to investigate the roles uh, of chromatin modifiers and micropeptides in establishing, uh, establishing and maintaining uh, cell identities and how uh, these are uh, dysregulated in neurodevelopment disorders. Um, today, she will share uh, with us a recent story on some big roles for tiny proteins in vertebrate uh, neurodevelopment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Valerie, and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Roberto, and I'm so happy to, to be here and to be invited for this, um, this wonderful seminar series. Um, I'm going to play my screen. Just tell me if you can see it, and then I can go ahead and get started. Okay. Can you see the title screen? Yes, I, I see the uh, the slide, uh, but it's not in the uh, in the mode, presentation mode. Okay, let me. Uh, oh, I see. Let me reshare. Maybe that's the problem. Yes, it's better. Mm -hmm. I'll just share my whole my whole screen. How about that? Okay, and. So now awesome. we are. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Valerie Tornini. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Heraldis Lab at the Department of Genetics at Yale School of Medicine. And today, I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about big roles for tiny peptides in vertebrate neurodevelopment. So now I want to, to start with the idea that we build a complex organism from a single cell. And this is what the process looks like in zebrafish. And it's really a beautiful process where from a single cell, we're able to get multiple tissues and cell types. I'm gonna play that video just one more time because it, it really is an extraordinary process. And this is a process that's conserved throughout uh, development um, in animals. And another way that we can think about this is that we build a complex organism from a single genome that's in the fertilized embryo. And across time, these different cell types will become uh, progressively differentiated into all different kinds of, of cell types. And I'm particularly interested in how the brain forms. Uh, and this is a, a cartoon version of, of the, the over 100 cell types that make up a zebrafish brain. And why do I use zebrafish to study, um, to study this process? Well, zebrafish is a really wonderful vertebrate model of neurodevelopment. And we saw a little bit about behavior in the talk right before. And so I'm going to talk to you about some of the other components that make zebrafish a great model for this. So here we're looking. Um, this is what a zebrafish looks like um, just around five days post fertilization. We're looking from the top, the dorsal view. This is an example of what cellular, the types of cellular resolution that we can get. We can also map different cell types and neural activity and circuits. Um, and there are other reasons for this. So by five days post fertilization, we have around 100,000 brain cells that are, that are specified and build the brain. So this is a really manageable number to actually dissect some of the, the mechanisms for this process. We have a lot of homologous brain structures with mammals. So this makes it really um, a good translational model. There are also conserved circuits, neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. Um, we have the, a lot of the, now we have a lot of the genetics uh, the genome editing and genomics tools to be able to assess some of these, um, these aspects of, of development. 
Importantly, for zebrafish, we have large clutches that develop really fast. And this is really important to be able to do statistical analyses and to be able to get enough numbers um, of, of these young developing animals to be able to study them. Uh, and lastly, they also have exquisitely stereotyped behavior. And this also enables us to, to quantify and, and have statistics on those behaviors, but also be able to potentially do screening, including drug screening. So now my big question is, how are these diverse cell types, especially in the brain, specified? And when I think about this, I think about the cell's identity and how it's determined by its transcriptome. And what does this mean? So within each cell, we have uh, each cell will have its own chromatin and DNA conformation uh, and will allow for transcription, so the tr cell's transcriptome. And this includes coding RNAs that will produce proteins uh, as an output, but also non-coding RNAs. We also have the accessibility for transcription factor binding and transcription factors present in a cell. We also have different histone modifications that will, um, that will change a cell's um, ability to, to modulate its transcriptome. And today let's focus on just this transcription part. And there's a reason why I put this non-coding RNAs here uh, as well. If we zoom into what is, uh, encompasses the, the whole transcriptome, we see that um, for the coding RNAs, this means that they will produce proteins, there's less than 3% of the genome will have, um, will actually code for proteins. M the majority of the transcriptome is actually non-coding RNAs. Um, and so when, um, and so that, that's what makes up the, the cell's identity. One thing that's interesting here in terms of the coding RNAs, on the right, I'm showing a, a little graph showing the abundance, so that the number uh, across looking at different protein sizes. And one thing that becomes obvious is when you look uh, between 110 amino acids and 90, you see this a drastic drop. And why is that? So um, is this actually true that the, we kind of have these small proteins that we, just, we don't have? Or um, what most likely is, and now we know is true, is that a lot of the technological um, developments now have allowed us to say, well, there are um, these small proteins um, that we're not having an arbitrary cutoff of around 100 amino acids, and that we're just missing a lot of them, um, a, a, a lot of these and their identities. So one of the ways to identify what these um, these proteins could be is through ribosome profiling. And on the left here, I have just a brief cartoon um, about what this looks like. So what this process does and, and this, this protocol does is get all the, the actively translating transcripts that the ribosome is bound um, and basically sequencing those ribosome protected fragments um, and seeing where those line up in the genome. And we see essentially ribosome footprints uh, on here. And this is what a track looks like, all these reads building up. Um, and when we look at what that sequence looks like here, uh, where we see plus one, plus two, plus three, we're looking at the different frames. So ATG or some start codon and the, the three nucleotide plus that in could encode a protein and the control of the input down here. So in a cartoon version, this is kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at all the different RNAs that may have a ribosome bound and will actually be translating um, these proteins. So this is one way to identify these proteins. And ultimately what we're now finding is that we are missing a world of these small proteins that can perform a number of different functions that maybe some of the larger proteins themselves would not be able to, to perform. So when I started my project, we said, okay, how can we find these, these small proteins? So one of the things that we did in the, in the Heraldis lab and other labs was do ribosome footprinting in zebrafish uh, and, and other species. And then we performed an in situ hybridization screen for some of these micropeptides. And what you'll notice here in the name, some of these names, they say link, a lot of them say link. These were pu identified previously as long intergenic non-coding RNAs, but really we see they seem to have in, be encoding some of these small proteins. So now what this allows us to do is expand the sequences that we're looking for in the coding RNAs to a much larger pool to be able to identify and, and, um, and discover some of these small proteins. So today I'm gonna take you on a journey on just one two actually of these molecular players. And I'll show you how we went from understanding the identity and molecular functions to how they affect the different cell states uh, of, of the zebrafish, how these altered cell states affected circuits and pathways um, that ultimately affected organismal behavior. 
So let's start actually with the, with the process. We're gonna kind of go backwards. So we're gonna use behavior to screen for those neurophenotypes. And we saw a lot of those micropeptides were really enriched in the developing brain and central nervous system. So we can use quantitative behavioral profiling of larval zebrafish. Um, and this is a really powerful tool to be able to assess changes in behavior and possibly in, in neurodevelopment. Here we're looking at a 96 well plate and here's a, a US penny for scale. And we're able to really track each, each larva individually. Um, here's what the video, you know, the setup looks like. And really, if you slow down the, the, the frames of the camera, we're able to uh, use subsequent sub-second uh, rest-wake activity to be able to track all these movements. So we took our panel of these, these candidate genes and we actually took a, an F0 approach, so just a, a, like a screening approach developed by the real lab at University College London, where we injected with CRISPR-Cas9 targeting those open reading frames, those putative um, protein coding uh, regions, uh, hoping to induce some changes in the, in the genes. And then at, from four to seven days posterization, we went ahead and compared each of those candidates to wild type and wild type injected with just the Cas9, so no guides targeting any genes. And when we did this, we were able to, um, to check any kind of behavioral parameters. And by behavioral parameters, I mean um, all differences in activity, how much they sleep, when they sleep, when they're active, how long it takes them to wake up, et cetera. And we can normalize all of those parameters uh, to wild type levels. And then in each of our F0s, we can see whether each of those parameters either decreased or increased compared to the wild type, generating this kind of a, a fingerprint. And one of the results came out was that two of these genes, actually link MyPEP and link WRB uh, mutants, shared a very similar behavioral pro fingerprint. And that was just a cartoon, but this is what the real data looks like. So here are those parameters that I was telling you about, daytime and nighttime, different parameters. The numbers don't, don't matter right now, but what's striking is that both the, the link MyPEP in green and link WRB in orange were really similar in, in their pattern, which is, is a little bit striking. Um, so these are the fingerprints that we had for, for each of these. So link MyPEP and link WRB, I described what, what this looks like. And here we see that they really do seem to be encoding this, you know, this kind of protein over here in blue and down for link WRB in orange. And another striking um, thing about these was that they had this ultra conserved three prime untranslated region sequence in their transcripts. So here's the stop codon for each of those that would make the protein. And then they continued on to have like this really, really identical um, sequence. So this suggested to us that they maybe were related somehow, which would match the, the behavior that we saw. To understand now the question whether they are indeed acting as protein coding or, or actually non-coding RNAs, we had to make very stable mutants of all different of different varieties. So here I'm showing you the, the transcription start site, the open reading frame, so the start codon would be here. And on the right, I'm showing you the different mutations that we generated for each of these with the blue line showing where, where the CRISPRs were targeted and the gray showing where the deletion or change was. So here we're deleting the whole DNA region, here just the ATG, and here in the middle of the open reading frame. And what does this allow us to do? This allows us to interrogate whether this, um, this region functions as maybe just a regulatory region, an enhancer. So if this were true, um, and it functions as a regulatory region, if we're looking for behaviors, we would expect this to see that this mutant does have some phenotype. In our case, uh, I'll show you what the phenotype looks like. Um, but these mutations would not would not really um, change very much about, about this. So it's, it, these would not really have a phenotype. If this is um, transcript functioning as a protein coding region and you interrupt the, the open reading frame, uh, here you, know, you have the, the ribosome coming along and making the, pro the protein. And if you interrupt that process, you won't have that protein. And therefore uh, we should have, uh, in each of these mutants, we should have some phenotype. And lastly, if we, if we know that this is functioning as a long non-coding RNA and we remove the, um, the start codon for the protein, um, the, ribos you know, the, the RNA will be just fine and it'll function as it's expected to. Um, and that really shouldn't have, have a, um, a phenotype. And so this is what would be expected if this were, were the case. 
So now these are the, the copies of the different mutations that I made for both link MyPEP and link WRB, and these are all stable. And what we went ahead and did is test now the behavioral phenotypes for each of those mutants uh, in zebrafish. Here I'm showing you again on the left the tracking um, for, for the, the behavior tracking. And on the right, we have the average activity levels across time. And zebrafish are diurnal like, like humans, so they're awake during the day and they sleep at night and again uh, the, the next day. So in wild type, we can see what a normal um, behavior activity level looks like. In the heterozygous mutants, we now see an increase in activity levels. And in the homozygous mutants, we now see a quite extreme uh, hyperactivity in, in these. And what I'll summarize here is that essentially all of the link MyPEP and link WRB mutants are hyperactive. Uh, and this really goes to show what we had expected if this was a protein coding um, function for these genes that, the, that we would expect a phenotype in all three, all of these types of mutations. Now, I mentioned that we think that these were related. When we cross these double, double heterozygous fish together, we're able to generate double homozygous mutants. And this is what now the extreme daytime hyperactivity looks like compared to both the wild type in orange and the double heterozygous here in gray. And here I'm just going to show you a, a one minute uh, bin, so the, the movement of one fish per well for one minute. And just look at the screen for a minute and see if you can tell which are the hyperactive double mutants and which are the wild types. And indeed, I think, I think it was pretty clear that you can see the top over here is wild type and the bottom is really quite hyperactive. So this is a very visual phenotype as well. And this is what the tracking looks like uh, if you look at the, the tracking there for the double mutants compared to wild type. Our next question was, okay, if this really is protein coding, can we rescue with protein coding over expression? So not just the RNA, but the actual proteins. To do this, we made a transgenic overexpression line. So um, using a ubiquitous promoter expressing everywhere, this link my PEP um, coding sequence. And we are just using an mCherry tag um, uh, th that's cleaved to actually see it, be able to see it. On the left over here, we see our controls. So we have the wild types compare, of the link MyPEP compared to the, the homozygous mutant here in green. And we don't see any red in these. So this is just the normal hyperactivity that we saw before. And now when we add the link MyPEP um, expression, we see that that hyperactivity in these mutants is now normalized to the wild type levels, really suggesting that we can rescue with protein coding over expression um, that, that phenotype. So to summarize just this part, we found that link MyPEP and link WRB are indeed protein coding, and we confirm this with antibody staining. And we found that the loss of function results in dosage dependent hyperactivity. So now the question becomes well, why are they hyperactive? What are the circuits and pathways that, that are affected that are causing them to be so hyperactive? To, to, ask, to address this question, we go back to those fingerprints that I showed you at the beginning. All right, so we have now the, the fingerprints for the wild type and the stable mutants, all the stable mutants that we made. And we can now say, well, how do we get from this wild type to the mutant phenotype? One of the ways that we can do this is, well, we can treat wild type fish with a panel of drugs that we know what their targets are. And we can see which of those fingerprints essentially match the mutant, uh, suggesting that those pathways and circuits might be the ones that are, that are affected that we can then test in our mutants. And indeed, this is what my collaborator uh, and co-mentor Jason Real did during his postdoc, um, where they took um, wild type fish and ran them through a panel of over 500 uh, drugs and pharmacological agents and generated those exact same fingerprints for all those drugs. And then I went in and asked, where does link my pep fingerprint correlate with the different drug behavioral fingerprints? And when we do this, this is what the, the data looks like. And I'll attract your attention here to two main um, targets that we identified. So the top target was this NMDA um, glycine site antagonist. And then we got multiple sites for glucocorticoid receptor agonists. So like cortisol or, or, or stress really be, um, being activated through those, those receptors. So we went ahead and tested in vivo what this looks like and how these pathways are affected. So here, when we, um, I'm showing you just the average activity across um, day and night of either the wild type or the homozygous mutant. And now when we add 
an uh, NMDA receptor antagonist, that was that top hit, we now see that the, the wild type here um, in green, wild type plus the drug, now reaches the same levels as the homozygous mutant. And the homozygous mutant with the drug also maxes out. So they're really hitting some uh, a ceiling of activity, suggesting that this is a common pathway that is affected in mutants. A different type, it seems like there's a, the, the other drugs that we found, the glucocorticoid receptor activators or agonists, um, when we add those now to, to our, our mutants here in green, the mutant plus drug, now we see uh, an exacerbation of that hyperactivity phenotype, um, suggesting that they're sensitized to, to glucocorticoids. Um, and just to drive home that point, when we look even at nighttime, which is, which is a little bit um, uh, more malleable for these, these um, modulations. Here we have just no drug between wild type and mutant. And now when we add the drug to the wild type or to the mutant, we see this really sensitization, so extreme hyperactivity as a result of those. So uh, for this part, we were able to use behavioral fingerprinting to identify the NMDA, that these mutants really um, mimicked NMDA receptor antagonism and that they were sensitized to glucocorticoids. So now what does that mean for in terms of the, the cell state? So why are we getting these pathways that are that are affected? To understand the effects on cell states, we need a little bit more information about what these proteins might be doing. So a little bit more about their molecular functions. And here we went and looked at the actual protein sequence and conservation. And what we found is that link MyPEP and link WRB have homology to high mobility group N1. Here I'm showing you on the top and on the bottom, the amino acid sequence for each of these proteins, and in the middle, the human, the human sequence. In cyan or in green here, we can actually see the conserved functional domains, and especially the nucleosomal binding domain, this regulatory domain, and this chromatin unwinding domain that are required for function of HMGN1, at least as, as we know it in human and in mouse. So what is this gene? So this is what, what in a cartoon fashion it looks like. Uh, so this gene, APMGN1, binds directly to the nucleosome. It has preferential binding at open chromatin, uh, so, so accessible region, but it does not have a DNA recognition sequence, so there's no like binding motif or anything. It seems to fine-tune accessible regulatory elements, and importantly, it's only been found in vertebrates. In terms of maybe some human health connotations, this gene is overexpressed in Down syndrome or in trisomy 21, and it has been more recently identified as an autism spectrum disorders risk gene. So now with this understanding of what this could be doing, we want to understand what is this, um, what is this protein doing um, and in terms of in the cells and how they're affecting the chromatin and what cells are most dependent on linked MyPEP and linked WRE proteins such that if we remove them, how are the different cell types or maybe all cell types affected? In order to do this, we turn to single cell RNA and attack sequencing, uh, so chromatin accessibility sequencing to reveal affected cell states. Here we have that cartoon version of the brain with all the, the hundred of cell types that it, it's comprised of. And we can compare the wild type or the homozygous link my pet mutant brains at six days post-fertilization post where we see that hyperactivity phenotype. And we can perform single nuclear, single cell multi-ohm analysis. So from a single cell, we're able to capture both the RNA expression and the chromatin accessibility, which at the beginning I told you is what will define a cell's identity. This is what the data looks like. So here I'm showing a two-dimensional representation of each of these cells um, and each dot here represents a cell and, and they're clustered together based on essentially how similar their cell states are to each other. And this is integrating both the, R, the transcriptome, so the RNA and the chromatin accessibility profiles for each of these. When we now merge, and here's just color, the same graph, color coded by either the wild type cells, so cells that came from wild type brains or cells that came from the link my pet homozygous mutant, we can see that they actually overlap pretty nicely. Um, so we're looking really for what are the main differences. So to find those, those differences, we thought, okay, well, maybe it's that they're expressed. These genes are expressed in some cell types. Um, and it doesn't, that doesn't seem to be the case. So this is the plot, the expression um, plots for link MyPEP and link WRB, and they seem to be expressed fairly ubiquitously. So we had to turn to some uh, computational analyses to 
um, to identify the most affected cell states. So here I'm going to show you just um, a toy model for how this analysis works. So here we're looking at um, the different sample labels, color-coded as I just showed you, either wild type or mutant. And the, these dots in the middle represent the centers of those different clusters um, that, that we're able to, to identify them. And clusters mean probably cell, cell states for the purposes of this talk. So we can see this mixing of cells, um, but we do see some shift in this color. So if we now computationally say, well, where are these cells most likely coming from or what do they most look like? We can determine a relative likelihood if they're coming from either wild type or mutant brains to see which are the most different. And we can quantify that or give it uh, an actual score and see um, what, what that looks like and say, okay, this is within normal range. So these two clusters, one and two like these, um, look pretty, pretty even. So this cluster one and four seem to be the most different from each other. So this is how the, the analysis works. When we applied it to our, um, to our analyses, we then also wanted to understand in each of these most affected clusters, how at the cell level or at the cell state level are, is this being changed? So what are the different genes that are expressed in that cluster in wild type or mutant? What are the different um, transcription factor motif overrepresentation or, or enrichment? And how are the different chromatin, um, chromatin regions that are differentially accessible? So the real data looks like this. Uh, in, uh, in our mutant brains, we find that uh, here highlighted with these asterisks, glial progenitors, granule cells, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, and differentiating progenitors or neurons are the most different between these wild type and mutant, mutant cells. When we go in, and, and I'll explain a little bit about that, when we go in and actually look at the single cell chromatin, so chromatin accessibility peaks, we can look per cluster in the wild type cells or in the mutant cells and see which of these peaks, so how open or closed that they are, are the most different. So things like, like these in, in these um, uh, boxes. On the right over here, now we can see the statistically different attack peaks, so chromatin accessibility peaks, um, color-coded here by um, the different peaks, color-coded by yellow meaning more open, and black it means more closed. And each of these lines is um, going down is a single cell, either wild type in blue or link my pep in, in orange over here. And we can see a really distinct difference between the wild type and the mutant cells, especially in these oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, which will, um, which are the myelinating cells for, which will derive the myelinating cells of the brain. When we now check in vivo, if, if we see this true, um, we crossed our wild type and our double mutants into OLIC2 GFP transgenic fish to be able to label those OLIC2 positive cells, which include some of these oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, among other populations. And especially in the cerebellum, where we see those, especially those granule cells, we see a massive depletion of these cells. Um, and here it is quantified here. And this is really important, right? Uh, one second, I need to turn the, the lights on, apparently. All right, hopefully that <laughs> a little action in the presentation. So when we do when we do quantify this, here we can see the statistics um, for, for these types of images. And now, as I mentioned, when we now look at the cell type specific changes in transcription factor expression and accessibility, we can see the, uh, essentially how these, these transcription factors, which will define and, and are required for establishing these cell states, um, are changed. And so, as I mentioned, these oligodendrocyte progenitor cells are will give rise to the myelinating cells of the of the brain, and the cerebellar granule cells are the excitatory um, cells of the cerebellum, which are also required. So now we're trying to think how is this affecting the behavioral phenotypes that we saw. So to summarize this part, we now uh, know um, that these and by antibody staining as well. We said these are nucleosomal binding proteins, and we see broad changes to chromatin accessibility. And the most, um, the most affected cell states when we don't have these are these cerebellar granule cells and oligodendrocyte progenitor cells that rely most on these proteins. So now we can start to piece together the effects that we saw on the cell states and how those are the cells that may be most affected by, um, th these are the cells that are more affecting the NMDA um, receptor and glucocorticoid receptor um, pathways. 
and how when we affect those we now see the 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 effect on on the hyperactivity when we don't have these proteins so i hope today that you've followed me on this journey from going to understanding the molecular functions really really deep in the molecular functions and kind of zooming all the way out into how this affects organismal behavior but we can go in this case one step further and think a little bit about the evolution of vertebrate gene regulation and how we get um, essentially new new cell types or how these cell types um, will will react in different evolutionary contexts and in disease. And if you'll um, maybe placate me and, and walk and um, entertain me for a little bit about some speculation here. So at the beginning of the talk, I told you two things. I told you that this gene seemed to be a vertebrate specific protein that binds nucleosomes. And I also told you that there was this um, ultra conserved three prime ETR sequence in both transcripts, which so just that they're related, but there's also some, some pressure to maintain that type of sequence. So this got us thinking about, well, um, it, you know, what are the origins of the HMG in one gene? We thought that they were non-coding at first and maybe evolutionarily they were. Um, so now how, how can we start to think about this? So here I'm just going to give, I know this is a zebrafish talk, but I think it's important to put into context the power of zebrafish and also where it, it fits in when we want to study maybe some evolutionary questions. So here we have um, the, uh, essentially a, a tree for, um, for some of these different species that I list here. And um, some of the more important key points here when we think about the, the shift between maybe invertebrate and vertebrate development is the acquisition of, of, of brain segmentation and the appearance of neural crests and placodes. The shift between jawless vertebrates and jawed vertebrates, which is where zebrafish are, are now hinged jaws, paired appendages, and myelination. Here we have the spotted gar and elephant shark, which are really useful tools because they're really slow, very, really slow evolving genomes. So it's, it kind of gives us a historical view of, of what was, um, you know, how the genomes kind of looked before. And in terms of HMGN1 in humans, so it, it, it does have one of the largest families of pseudogenes. And importantly, may for, for this audience, HMGN1 is overexpressed in Down syndrome, as I, as I mentioned before. So now let's look at maybe how, um, how this gene kind of evolved. And this is something that, that was really striking to us. So in Amphioxus, which is this invertebrate species, we see that this gene, Apex1-like gene, it's a completely different gene, is near this WRB um, gene, which is what um, the link WRB in zebrafish is near, near. In lamprey, we start to see this unannotated um, HMGN-like type of protein, and especially it shares this N-terminal sequence with the, the lamprey um, one over here, the, sorry, the, the, the amphioxus over here. So maybe this is starting to get at the origin of these genes and is still next to WRB. In the spotted gar, we now see um, the same gene, this, this WRB and HMGN1. Maybe it's not really annotated very well, but we also see MyPEP um, starting to appear over here. And this now leads us, if we think about evolution, um, this MyPEP, which is right next, the link MyPEP is right next to MyPEP, and it's also integrated into this IGSF5 gene. It's in the first intron in chromosome 10. And then chromosome 15, because of the genome duplication in zebrafish, we see this linked WRB again right next to WRB as we had seen in the previous species. And lastly, in humans, if we look at HMGN1, and these are known, we, we know what the sequence looks like. Again, we see HMGN1 being retained right next to WRB. And we also see on chromosome 21, this IGSF5, which is where in zebrafish, we saw this link MyPEP essentially being integrated. So this gives us uh, an idea about the origin of this HMGN family and how it, it kind of grew, maybe duplicated itself. Um, and I want to bring your attention to what I told you before that the, the cerebellar cells and oligodendrocytes were the most affected. I showed you that HMGN1 essentially appears, starts to appear in the lamprey or in these jawless vertebrates, and myelination, which is what the oligodendrocytes do, starts to appear in within jawed vertebrates. The ancestral vertebrate brain, uh, and here using lamprey as a, as a model, essentially lacks the cerebellar cell types and oligodendrocytes. And so this got us really thinking about, well, could there be some co-evolution of newer vertebrate cell type 
gene regulatory networks and HMGN1. And so one of the questions that we had, which is a little bit out there is, well, what happens if we express HMGN1 in an organism that doesn't have this gene, the, the HMGN1 gene? To do this, we collaborated with the Mardic Lab at, UC, at University of California, Berkeley, and we drove a ubiquitous promoter driving either link MyPEP or human HMGN1. And we overexpressed that in Lamprey. And now we're doing chromatin accessibility um, sequencing and chip sequencing to see if maybe now we can see either genes or transcription factor sites for all the dendrocyte progenitor cells or some of these cerebellar cells that are now accessible. If you express this protein, now do you start essentially see the origins of these cell types, which otherwise don't exist in, in these animals. So I will I'll conclude here and essentially show you the power of zebrafish for asking all these questions, really spanning the, the, the gamut from looking at vertebrate gene regulation to really looking, honing down in the molecular functions, how those are affecting cell states, how we can understand the circuits and pathways being affected, and ultimately how it affects organismal behavior but also development. Um, and this, much of this work, some of it is unpublished, but much, much of it is on Bar Archive, and I welcome you to, to go and check it out. Um, it's, it's publicly available. And I'll bring back to the big question, which is how is cell identity established and maintained? And there's so many of these players that, that one can study, and there's no, no lack of questions to be able to, to study this. And I'll just end by saying that really a world of small proteins awaits, and there's a lot of these micropeptides that we can explore and see how, how they function in zebrafish and beyond. And with that, I'll end here, and I will acknowledge my advisor, my postdoctoral advisor, Antonio Geraldes, all the my um, collaborators and co-authors on the BioArchive paper, um, the Yale Center for Genome Analysis, the ZFIN, which is a really important community resource, uh, these images were created with a bio render. My contact information is here. And I also thank my funding sources and the sources that have funded um, this work. And with that, I'll conclude and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, it was a really great talk uh, with a great summary of your work. Um, I'm really pleased to, to see so much uh, interesting work uh, in just less than one hour and hour uh, we have some questions uh, obviously because uh, your exciting work have um, have these kind of questions uh, flavio zolesi uh, um, congratulated uh, with your work and uh, he is asking um, if you have antibodies uh, to those peptides and if so uh, if you have We've made uh, immunofluorescence to see exactly in which cells they are and where inside uh, and if they are inside the cells. Yes. Um, so thank you, Flavia, for that question. Um, so we do have antibodies. And in the bioarchive, we show very, very briefly some of the staining and that they're gone in the mutants. Um, we also see that they are very much enriched in the nucleus, as would be expected, and excluded from dividing cells, which, again, is, is known um, from, from human cells. Um, they're, they're for sure enriched in nucleus and pretty ubiquitously expressed, um, though we're now doing much more detailed analyses on exactly what cell types, especially those oligodendrocytes and cerebellar cells and how, um, maybe they're di slightly different levels or, or localizations. They, I see your, your, maybe your next question is they, um, are not really, they don't seem to be soluble. They don't seem to be that much expressed in the in the cytoplasm. And so we really do think they have, are mostly functioning at the nuclear, at least at the nuclear level, at least as the full length. There is some data in human and mouse that, that suggests that they may, part of it may work for some other, um, in other functions, but that's not my data. And I'm happy to, to send you the, the papers for those. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, because uh, I guess that you already uh, tried to reply the second question, right? Or yeah, and I, yeah, sorry. And I will add that they do have um, nuclear localization signals that really drive them into the nucleus. Um, so um, I don't, I don't have evidence that they are not used for cell communication um, via exosomes or cytomines. But um, 
in our hands that this is what we've studied. Okay, uh, great. I guess that uh, probably Flavio uh, is uh, happy for uh, for your replies. Um, I'm trying to see if we have uh, extra questions. Uh, I don't know uh, if we have more. If, uh, if we have some questions, it looks like that not yet. Uh, so Flavio is thanking uh, thanking you. So uh, Valerie, uh, I also thank you. Uh, the presentation was really awesome, uh, and uh, we will now uh, do um, some uh, some uh, gap for the next presentations for the next session, and I hope that uh, everyone uh, will be here uh, during the afternoon so thank you uh, all for uh, assisting to our uh, presentation uh, to this session and the fantastic presentation that we have today thank you valerie and uh, all the, all the ones that have uh, presented today thank you great thank you very much